Hello, I'm Professor Claire Smith and I'm Head of Anatomy at Brighton and Sussex Medical School and today we're going to talk about surface anatomy. We well, might be thinking, well, what is surface anatomy, Claire? Surface anatomy and anatomy actually means in Greek to cut apart, to cut the body apart. So anatomy involves different components. It involves osteology, the study of our bones. It involves histology, the study of actually when we look down a microscope at really fine detail what our body looks like. It involves gross anatomy, and that's not just like gross as in, oh, that's horrible. Gross anatomy is actually about what we see with our, with our eyes. So the study of muscles, bones, nerves, etc. It also involves the study of imaging, how we see the body through ultrasound, through x-ray, through MRI, and how we study embryology. So how, why we're not the same when we're very tiny to when we're, we're an adult and how we change during ageing. Why might we need to know about surface anatomy? Surface anatomy forms the basis of clinical examination for doctors, dentists and a range of healthcare professionals. I'm sure you've all been to a healthcare professional. You've all had maybe your lungs listened to or a bone examined or an area that was sore, palpated or percussed um, and felt and assessed. So surface anatomy is really important for us to be able to make diagnoses, for understanding treatment um, and for a range of other things too. When we think about anatomy, we have to think about the anatomical position and this enables us to always come back to how the body is viewed. And you now can undertake the anatomical position. So I'd like you to stand there with your head facing straight, your eyes facing straight. Put your arms down by your side with your palms facing forward. Stand with your feet together and your toes pointing forward. And this is the anatomical position from which all other types of movement and terms are described. So for example, if I want to think about something that's above or below, I might use the term superior and inferior. If I want to describe something that's towards the front of the body, I'd use the term anterior, or the back of the body, posterior. There's a few more terms as well, but hopefully that gives you some starting points. When we think about surface anatomy, we think about actually what can be seen from the outside, the moment perhaps a patient walks in through the door. So it's about looking at the surface projections that are given by the body. And this might be about where bones are within our skin. It might be looking at the colour of our skin, um, any, um, any injuries or anything, any, any medical conditions. Surface anatomy allows us to gently feel and palpate the skin to understand what is normal, what is maybe anatomical variation, but also what might be pathological. And surface anatomy has been used for centuries as part of diagnosis and treatment and continues to be a really important part of healthcare training today. Surface anatomy links to imaging, and when x-rays were invented in 1895, um, this first enabled us to see inside the body. Um, later on in the 1920s, so kind of only in the past 100 years, have we had ultrasound. And ultrasound enables us to link surface anatomy, so what we might see and feel on top of our body, and we can really quickly put a probe on and see actually structures within the body, and in a way that is quick, is harmless, and the patient doesn't feel any pain. Ultrasound is as portable as our phones, so it's really quick and easy, and may one day overtake actually the stethoscope um, as a means of examination and treatment. We've been talking a little bit about um, touching and feeling, and in medical terms, these are called palpation. So palpation is where using your dominant hand on your index finger and your middle finger, you gently press structures, and you're pressing to feel for structures such as bone and muscle. 
It also involves percussion when you're looking to understand what a sound a structure makes. Um, and to do this is slightly more complex, but you're going to be using um, over to make some sound. And you might go over an area which is really dull sounding, like the liver or bone, or an area which is really hollow, like the stomach or the lungs, for example. It's important to think that we are all individuals and we are not textbooks. Textbooks and other medical resources are amazing and they give us the most common form of what the human body is. But I can guarantee that structures within your body are different to structures within your brothers or sisters or family or friends' bodies. We are all unique and this is why the study of anatomy is still evolving. This is also really why um, healthcare needs to learn on lots of different patients um, and needs to examine people to understand actually how that might be, um, not only across different individuals, different genders and different ages of people as well. When considering anatomy and surface anatomy, we need to think about what skin colour might be as a variant. We need to think about body size as well as well as gender and assigned sex at birth. There is also natural variation, and I'm going to give you an example of natural variation. If we're looking at this muscle here, and it's called palmaris longus, and to see if you have it, you take your thumb and your little finger, and you squeeze them together, and against a little bit of resistance, so either get someone to pull that way, um, or resist it, and you can see that just here, and here I have two tendons. If I had this muscle, I would have a tendon that elevated came up right in the midline here, but I don't. This muscle palmaris longus goes up into your palm and was a really essential muscle for helping us squeeze our palm to hold on to things as part of our evolution. And in some of us, many, many years ago, that muscle just disappeared. And this evolution is happening all the time in our bodies. There's muscles within our body, within our hands and our feet um, that will be slowly evolving as, as, as our bodies evolve. The world around us evolves far quicker than our bodies can keep up. Our natural evolution takes hundreds of millions of years. Um, and this is an example of that. So we're going to have a look and to see if we can see this muscle palmaris longus. And my good colleague Catherine here has this muscle on one side, but not on the other, which is also part of normal variation. So on Catherine's left side, I'm going to ask her to bring her little finger and her thumb together. And we're going to tense her wrist. And immediately we can see really clearly this tendon in the middle. And this is the palmaris longus tendon. We can also see tendons just on the right and left side that are also helping Catherine flex her wrist. If I ask Catherine to do this on the other side, thank you, we can see that there is no equivalent tendon. We can see some of the other tendons that are helping Catherine flex her wrist. So on this side, the palmaris longus tendon is scrunching up her palm and helping her flex. On this side, it doesn't matter that she hasn't got it, it's just the same effect. Um, but being brought about by other muscles. When thinking about surface anatomy, we need to think about the largest organ of the body, and that is our skin. Our skin is amazing, and it's there to give us physical protection, to help regulate our body temperature, and to produce vitamin D. Our skin is divided into three layers. The very outer layer is called the epidermis and the epidermis has layers of keratin sat on top of it. And this keratin can be really thin, if we were to take the example of our eyelid, or it can be really thick if we take the example from the sole of our foot. The next layer down is the dermis, and the dermis contains sweat glands and hair follicles um, and some really special muscles called the erector papillae muscle. And this muscle makes a hair follicle move so that your hair can stand on end. And this is important in regulating our temperature. So you might notice when you walk into a cold environment, your hairs on your arm, for example, stand on end. And this traps the heat nearer our body. We then move down to the innermost layer, and this is called the hypodermis. 
and the hypodermis contains varying amounts of fat or adipose tissue as it's medically known. And the amount of adipose tissue or fat varies depending on the body region. So back to our eyelid example, there's not a lot of adipose tissue in your eyelid, but in areas such as your abdomen or your thighs, for example, there might be more amounts of fat.